The key features of this slideshow include unpacking the concept of momentum um, and looking further into motion and force. So again, um, a couple of terms from last week will pop up this week and hopefully you'll start to see the very interconnected nature of these uh, concepts. We'll be looking further at linear and angular motion and then unpacking momentum to look at conservation or the transfer of momentum and also the concept of summation of momentum. Um, finally, impulse is an idea you'll be having a look at. All these uh, concepts, while you don't have the language, you'll be very um, well aware of how they function in sport um, in your experience. It's really a matter of putting a name to a biomechanical concept. This is one of the more intense weeks in terms of content you need to work your way through and vocabulary that you'll pick up. So it's essentially momentum and in impulse, but there's a few applications of it and quite a lot of concepts going on. Stick with it, play the uh, web links, read the textbook and ask questions and always, as much as possible, try and relate the definition back to something that you do in your sport. We now start to look at this concept of momentum, which is the title of this slideshow. Um, and it's by definition, a measure of the amount of motion an object has and its resistance to changing that motion. It's comprised of mass times velocity, and it has the letter abbreviation of P. So momentum equals mass times velocity. Some basics first. If two objects have the same velocity but different masses, the object with the greater mass will have the greater momentum. So if those two sumo wrestlers move at the same velocity, the gentleman on the left with the bigger mass, the bigger inertia, is going to generate a greater momentum. So that's just logic with some biomechanical terms thrown on top. And on the flip side, when the, the mass is the same, but we have different velocities, then the object with the greater velocity will have the greater momentum. So whichever, whichever of those two golf players that can generate the greatest speed at the golf club head on the ball, which has the same mass, will generate the greatest momentum and the ball will go further. And we'll be looking more closely at that with projectile motion next week. So here's the formula just unpacked in another textbook's uh, little table here, just showing you the top or peak momentum of various athletes. Uh, so we've got four athletes, two of them weigh 80 kilos, two of them weigh 90 kilos, and then they vary between eight and nine and 10 meters per second. Velocity should be meters per second squared. It's just a simple maths, which you don't have to do in the exam, but it's just trying to show you the momentum that different athletes can generate as a combination of what they I say what they weigh, but with their mass, which is measured in kilograms, um, and their velocity, which is the, the change in acceleration. So we've got the greatest one there, not surprisingly, coming from the heaviest person with the equal fastest. So the equal heaviest person with the equal fastest time, generating 900 um, units there for momentum. So while momentum equals mass times velocity, there are a couple of pretty cool concepts associated with it that we'll be looking at now. So conservation or transfer of momentum, and then we'll be looking at summation of momentum. So first and foremost, this is called a Newton's cradle. And by pulling one or two or three of those little balls, we get some pretty crazy things to happen to the other ones. Um, and it just basically states that the total momentum of the system before the collision is equal to the total momentum after the collision. So once that one ball bangs into the others, the one at the far end will bang off and it will, so it will go and so it will go until ultimately air resistance um, will slow down and stop that um, movement. But from the initial collision, momentum is said to be conserved. So the mass and the velocity are constant or held intact in that little system. To show you the same concept another way and probably a more sporting and everyday way, 10 pin bowling, we have conservation of momentum in the collision between the 10 pin ball the bowling ball and the skittles. So the skittles start with zero velocity, therefore zero momentum. Um, they've both got whatever mass they are, whatever they put them on the scales and whatever kilograms they come up as. But that ball will be moving with quite a head of steam. It'll have quite a decent momentum as a combination of its mass and velocity. When it strikes the pins, there will be an exchange such that the numbers, which we don't have to know, the numbers would be constant in that collision. So there'd be transference or conservation of momentum from the 10 pin ball to the, the skills. Unpacking force a little further, and in this slide we're just looking at how we can increase angular motion or rotation. 
So a force couple is when we have two equal forces in opposite directions and they purely cause rotation. Um, other than having a ball on the ground and having your left hand and right hand on it equally uh, opposite on the ball and putting a spin on it so it doesn't move other than to spin on the spot, I can't think of any example where we use a force couple um, in sport. However, for an eccentric force, which just means an off-center rather than a concentric force, uh, whenever you hit the top of the ball, say in a, like a volleyball spike, the ball will go forward, it will also spin. Equally, if you're kicking a soccer ball off the ground and you're coming around the outside of it with your right foot, you get the ball to go forward, but it'll also curve and spin. So force couple, equal and opposite, eccentric is off-center. Torque is probably the most important here. Torque, you might have heard it applied to cars and engines and things like that. We're talking about a turning effect. And what's dependent on torque or the spin or the angular um, motion, if you like, we can generate is the force that we use and how far we are away from the axis um, of that particular object. So force times moment arm. Moment arm just means the distance from the axis that we're getting the turning effect from. And here's a, a non-sporting slide to try and represent torque for you. And it's simply suggesting that and there's a lot going on in that slideshow, but the common sense here, if you wanted to turn that bolt with the, the wrench, um, you're much better off at the end of the, the lever or the longer arm. Um, in terms of torque, it's the longer moment arm. It requires much less force. So the force there is only 10 newtons to get that bolt to turn, compared to if we choke down the, the length of the, the wrench, we need twice as much force. And that just means to us when we are applying spin or a turning um, force on an object, it's better to apply it at the end of a longer moment arm. So a moment arm is simply the length between a joint axis and the line of force acting on that joint. If you can recall, we talked about velocity in the first slideshow as its relevance to acceleration. We can now look at it in angular rather than linear terms, so rotational. So it's simply just how quickly an object spins around an axis, but it must include that displacement um, rather than distance. So that again, if you start where you finish, your angular velocity will be zero, but we're clearly more interested in it while you are working. So angular velocity equals angular displacement, which is that change in position over time. This slide just serves to remind us of the difference between distance and displacement. So distance is the territory or ground covered and displacement is the positional change. Uh, this is just 10 pin bowling. So if you look at the top there, the displacement of that ball from holding it to releasing it if you go to the top of the circle is only 120 degrees, so the actual position will change from start to finish. However, that ball has traveled a distance of 240 degrees. And because we're looking at angular motion, we're looking at from the 360 degrees a circle makes. So the distance in this case from backswing to letting go, not including where the ball goes once it's left the hand, is 240 degrees. But the displacement or positional change is a half that's 120 degrees. This is probably an excellent time to press pause and try to gather your thoughts before we move on even further. Uh, angular momentum is a measure of the amount of momentum a spinning object has. Okay, um, and angular momentum, as opposed to linear momentum, which is mass times velocity, we now look at moment of inertia times angular velocity. So more terminology to play with. Uh, the obvious thing here is that an object spinning with a larger momentum will require a larger force to slow it or stop it spinning. But we're going to unpack the two terms, angular velocity and moment of inertia in a moment. Um, as angular momentum is angular velocity times moment of inertia, and we know that angular velocity is the angular displacement over time, we need to look at moment of inertia in regards to um, rotation or angular motion. So it's the reluctance of a body um, to rotate. And the formula is mass, so the kilogram value of the, the racket or the body or the object um, times the radius squared. So it's pretty simple to look at. You've got the size of the tennis rackets that vary from little kids to adults, but also the length of the racket. So the kilogram value of it or the gram value and also the length will have an impact on how easy it is to make that object rotate and to manage it. Having previously looked at conservation of linear momentum with Newton's cradle and the 10 pin bowling example with the, the pins, in terms of angular momentum, the conservation of angular momentum, we're talking about when a body or an object has left the ground and it's unable to apply a push or a pull force. And what it means is once we've done that, the moment of inertia and the angular velocity interact 
such that angular momentum won't change, although we can quite possibly see a change in moment of inertia and angular velocity. So the text there talks about as somebody tucks in like a gymnastics position, the moment of inertia decreases because the radius length has decreased. Uh, but at the same time, we increase the speed or angular velocity so that the two balance each other out and angular momentum is said to be constant. Now this crazy diagram tries to show that same concept just with um, some squiggly lines. So the top line there says that angular momentum is constant. It's the same once the gymnast here leaves the ground in, I suppose, two until they land in 10, angular momentum is constant. But because they go into a tight ball or a tuck position and then open back out into their um, open or long position, we have an interplay between angular velocity, if you like, the change in um, angular motion, displacement, and also the moment of inertia based on not so much the mass because the mass hasn't changed, but the radius squared. So as the gymnast tucks into a ball, the moment of inertia decreases. At the same time, that increases our speed or angular velocity. So if you look at six, for example, we are in a tight little ball, tight little tuck, and we have a very high angular velocity because we're in a small position. We have a very low moment of inertia. We've made it very easy to rotate because we've decreased the radius. So there's an interplay between moment of inertia and angular velocity, but this diagram is showing the concept of the conservation of angular momentum that does not change once you are airborne. Here's exactly the same concept, exactly the same example, just with different text and just a very isolated image there of a very long radius um, and a very small angular velocity versus a very high angular velocity and a very small moment of inertia. Here's the same concept, but with a different example. So rather than actually, I suppose, becoming a projectile, we're just talking about the runner here and their leg. And we all know that we don't run with straight legs. We actually bend at our knee. And there's an interplay here in moment of inertia and angular velocity as a consequence. So again, angular momentum can be said to be conserved throughout this action. Uh, so when the leg is bent, the moment of inertia or the reluctance of the leg or body or hip to rotate is reduced. And in doing that, we actually increase the speed or angular velocity at the leg so that we can talk about conservation of angular momentum in something as simple as running. The next concept to look at under the umbrella term of momentum, which is mass times velocity, is the summation of momentum. So it's really to generate maximum momentum. We will sum all our forces, if you like. And that's why it was previously called force summation or summation of forces. Uh, my news from VCAR is to please call it summation of momentum. So if you have a choice, summation of momentum is the term to use. Uh, the kinetic chain or the kinetic link principle uh, underpins this. So summation of momentum can occur in two ways. Uh, this first one, simultaneous, I think is much less frequent than sequential. So that's talking about all body parts working together at the same time, explosively or dynamically, uh, to maximize um, our momentum, which is mass times velocity. So examples would be things like long jump, high jump, and a sprint start, where there's a very dynamic and explosive movement from all body parts that are applying a force. So simultaneous summation of momentum. And the second application of summation of momentum is done when it's not all explosively in a fraction of a second, but spread out over a longer period of time, such that there is a series or a sequence of body parts contributing to generate maximum force or maximum momentum to be more accurate. So sequential summation of momentum, body parts contribute in sequence, in order, in a correct order, to get that fluent timing and build up on the, the pace established from the previous body part. It's not especially easy to see, but I think it's still a worthwhile diagram to put in here. So in transferring momentum to sequentially uh, get summation of momentum, the whole idea is to get timing right in moving from big um, body parts, big muscle groups, down to smallest um, body parts, smallest muscle groups. If you look at the left-hand data set, it says too late. What's actually happening is the body is doing its thing. So whether it's like your trunk twisting or whatever, the arm is then coming in after um, top momentum or top velocity of the body. And if you look at the forearm again in the same column, that left-hand column, it's coming in after we've really reached top speed. So it's a little bit too late. So we've got poor timing there. The middle one is also incorrect or not ideal because it's too early. You can see that the arm and the forearm are starting to do their thing before the preceding body part has got top um, momentum or top velocity. 
than in the well-timed one. That's the best example of it. Although for me, the body to the arm looks fine. The arm to the forearm is a little bit out. The forearm should be closer to the top part of that light blue um, arc or little, looks like a little dolphin. So it's really just talking about optimal timing to get the best summation of momentum possible for a sequential movement. So some of the keys are as best as you can to use as many body parts as possible. So making sure that you, you use your legs. If you're trying to get a jump shot for distance, you want to make sure you use your legs for a three point and get your legs involved. The heavier, slower body parts is almost always starting with the legs for most skills I can think of, moving through to the, the smaller ones, which in most cases is something like the wrist, possibly the ankle, obviously, for like kicking. Um, you're trying to have a platform from the preceding body part so that the next body part can, if you like, accelerate off that and making sure that it's all beautifully timed, much like the preceding diagram. So once the legs give what they can do, then the hips and the torso give what they can do, then the shoulders, the forearms, then finish off with the wrist. That would be the example for golf. I've added this slide here just to give you something, I suppose, to apply your knowledge a little bit. Now, biomechanically, once you strike a ball, um, once the ball leaves your foot or your hand or your club, any action thereafter has no impact on the ball. Biomechanically speaking, you've, you've applied your force and what you do after is irrelevant. However, we emphasize a follow through for the simple purpose that we don't really want to get any negative acceleration of body parts when we strike or kick or throw um, the particular object. So this golf player's beautiful follow through, fantastic. But remember, he struck the ball down close to his left foot. So everything else is just... Um, you would say superfluous to having an impact on the ball. It's irrelevant to having an impact on the ball. However, if he wasn't to emphasize that follow through, he runs the risk of having some negative acceleration of any part of his swing, which would then limit the, um, the power he can generate or the momentum he can generate on that ball. The last concept to look at in what's been a pretty heavy going, hopefully you've been pausing and making notes as we go. It's linked to um, force, uh, sorry, summation of momentum. And it just simply says that to get momentum of an object, an impulse must be applied. So we get a definition in a moment, but if you look at the pictures, they are both sequential um, force summation. And we've got the baseball pitcher at the bottom and the spinning discus thrower. So they really are just momentum, but impulse has just got a slightly different tweak to it. And it's as simple as this, force times time. So impulse is equal to the change in momentum of an object and the formula is force times time. So all things being equal, the greater time you can apply the force, the greater the impulse, the greater the impact on momentum. And we typically uh, manipulate that to increase velocity, if you like, but there are also times when we do it to be able to decrease it for our advantage. So I'm looking at this slide, we're just looking at impulse. So the top one is the rotational technique. So the person's actually spinning and the bottom B is the glide. So they're sliding across the circle for shot put. Both seek to increase the time that a force can be applied, but according to the principle of impulse, all things being equal, you'll be able to generate greater momentum from the rotational because you're in contact with the shot put for a longer period of time. Now, clearly everything has an optimum time and an upper limit. You wouldn't do 55,000 spins and think you're going to get greater speed. You've got to have control. But um, certainly the spinning or rotational discus throw would be more advantageous than the glide if you're able to hold on to the shot put and apply force over a greater period of time. That's just the principle of impulse. We can also use impulse to our advantage to decrease momentum rather than to increase momentum. And the best example here is I think cricket and something like a wicket keeper. And they really reach out to take the ball in front of their eyes and they bring it back um, in line with the hips. So we, they give with the ball and you might do that in other games as well. One, to decrease the risk of injury, but also I think two, to increase your chance of catching the ball rather than having it pop out. So just applying the force, the gloves or the hands on the ball over a longer period of time by reaching forward and bringing it back in the midline. So here we decrease impulse uh, to our advantage, equally decreasing momentum.